much for your kind invitation to speak at this international meeting. It has been uh, quite a few years since I met many of you in person, and I look forward to doing so in the near future. Um, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about my personal reflections on COVID-19 and how this has affected my occupational medicine practice. And the reason I thought of sharing this topic is that whenever we teach our residents, we tell them that it is very important that we have practice-based learning and improvement. This is the core competency. And we want our residents to be able to investigate and evaluate the care of patients. It's important that they are able to appraise and assimilate scientific evidence and continuously improve patient care. And this is done through constant self-evaluation and lifelong learning. So if we expect this from our residents, I think we as practitioners, we as teachers should also have the same expectations of ourselves. So what are my personal reflections on COVID-19? Well, the first thing I realized is that we as occupational health physicians are definitely involved in managing pandemics. So the question I'd like to ask all of us to think about is that how were we involved? And more importantly, did we add value to the response or did we not add value? Or worse still, did we hinder the response? The good thing is that we were not totally unprepared for this pandemic because all of us have had past experience in this part of the world there are many emerging infections. And I think our past experience has helped prepare us in some ways. Nevertheless, there are significant differences in COVID-19 and we have to adapt to the new normal. We had a brilliant lecture by Dr. Yabra about uh, what's the new normal in post-pandemic practice. And we have to prepare for that. What is important is that we keep up to date and we embrace change. So another question I'd like to think about is that what new changes did we embrace during this pandemic? And lastly, we have to prepare for the future. We have to get ready for the unknown. We don't know when this pandemic will end. We don't know whether something new will be coming, but we do know that it will be coming sooner or later, and are we prepared for that? So these are some of the issues which I'll be discussing. Well, we know that pandemics are not new to humankind. We know that there are many emerging infectious diseases. And uh, on average, throughout the world, there is one new novel pathogen which appears a year. And we've seen this pattern for the last few decades already. Living in Southeast Asia, this is a hotbed of emerging infections. And I remember living through uh, new viruses such as the Nipah virus in the 1990s. Then we had SARS in the early 2000s. Then we had avian influenza. We had MERS. We had all kinds of uh, different emerging infections. So our responses to all these new threats over the last few decades have prepared us somewhat for COVID-19. But in this particular response for COVID-19, which affects the whole world, which has impacted our countries tremendously, did we help? And did we add value? We have to constantly remain relevant to society 
to exist as occupational physicians and for our discipline to flourish. So what are some of the aspects of COVID-19 in occupational medicine practice? Well, we know that certain occupational medicine concerns would be who are the at-risk groups? Who are the occupational groups at risk? Are there any particular situations which pose greater risk than others? We know that mental health issues are very important. This is gonna impact not only our patients, but also the healthcare workers, the carers of patients, and even their families. For COVID-19, we've seen the emergence of a vaccination at warp speed. This is something new, which we didn't have for the earlier uh, emerging infections like SARS or different kinds of uh, MERS and so on. We're also seeing long COVID. And this is because I think COVID-19 has dragged on for two years or more. It has affected so many more people that we are seeing such cases. In contrast, SARS, which happened in 2003, affected much less people. It lasted for a shorter period, and therefore we didn't see uh, the long-term sequelae of the SARS infection. I think the world of work has also changed in the last few decades. You've heard from Professor Kang about the fourth industrial revolution and so on. So in some ways, uh, the changed world of work has made it easier for us to respond to the pandemic. But for the patients with COVID-19, when they go back to work or when they continue work, we will return to a changed world of work and we will have to adapt to that. So things like routine testing, routine risk assessments, we'll have to take that all in our stride as we go back to work. But basically, uh, with all these considerations, how prepared were we to face the pandemic? Now, when we compare the infections caused by the SARS coronavirus 1, which caused severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, with infections caused by the SARS coronavirus 2, which causes COVID 19, we see that sometimes the same, same but sometimes it's different. We know that both infections are caused by viruses from the coronavirus family. Uh, for SARS-CoV-1, there was only one kind of virus. But for SARS-CoV-2, we have the emergence of variants of concern. For example, Delta is very common with Omicron just appearing and everyone's observing that with great interest now. In terms of uh, symptoms, SARS-CoV-1 gave rise to predominantly respiratory symptoms, but SARS-CoV-2, we know, in addition to respiratory symptoms, also presented with anosmia, agusia, and now we have long COVID looming. Mental health issues affected both infections, but because SARS-CoV-1 lasted for a few months, it was more acute mental health issues, but for SARS-CoV-2, with lockdowns, with the prolonged nature of the pandemic, we have longer term mental health issues, burnout, uh, depression, and so on. In terms of mortality, the case fatality of SARS was 11%. That's about more than five times higher than the case fatality of SARS-CoV-2, but in terms of the number of people who died for SARS, worldwide, less than a thousand people died. But for COVID-19, now we have in excess of 5 million deaths. The RO was relatively lower for SARS compared to uh, COVID-19, and in terms of the numbers affected worldwide, there were, uh, I think, about 2,000 over cases, and uh, so about 9,000 cases uh, versus 
COVID-19, which is more than 260 million cases impacted. For the duration of the uh, pandemic, COVID-19 has been dragging on for more than two years, but SARS was over in eight months. SARS affected 29 countries, and for COVID-19, it's a global pandemic with over 220 countries affected. So we know that SARS was mainly an occupational infection affecting healthcare workers, but for COVID-19, although it can be an occupational infection, I think it's mainly a public health issue. For the occupations at risk for COVID-19, in addition to healthcare workers, we find that migrant workers are a huge population at risk, mainly because they live together in crowded dormitories. Um, we have institutional staff, not only in healthcare institutions, but also in prisons, in correctional facilities, in military barracks, and so on. These are occupations at risk. And our term frontliners are quite different for SARS and COVID-19. Frontliners are a much expanded group for COVID-19. The work environment in 2003 and the work environment now is impacted by huge advances in science and technology with different work characteristics. And even in technology, I remember contact tracing during SARS in 2003, it was mainly pen and paper and through telephone. Nowadays, we have applications, phone apps, Bluetooth tracing, and so on. Uh, vaccines. There was no vaccine for SARS, there's vaccines for COVID-19. Treatments are quite different now. And the role of social media is much, much expanded in COVID-19. WHO has coined the term infodemic, where sometimes erroneous information is spread rapidly throughout the world. And this fake news doesn't help uh, the response to COVID-19. There's also more apparent differences in the rich-poor divide. There is a digital divide. We find that those people with less access to uh, digital devices have less access to information, have less access to care services, and so on. We know that vaccine access is not equal throughout the world. We have Vaccine passports, almost a requirement now in many countries. And with that, there are also fake vaccine passports. There are fake reports of vaccination status or, or tests for your COVID status. For work, we're increasingly seeing mandated vaccinations now for COVID-19. We're seeing a lot more working from home, working from anywhere. Uh, the issues about returning to work safely with safe management measures required. So we were quite fortunate to be able to come up with some editorials and commentaries very early on. So one of the earliest pieces that we wrote, uh, that I wrote, was an editorial for the journal Occupational Medicine. This was published in the January 2020 issue of Occupational Medicine. Actually, it appeared in print in late February when we still did not see COVID cases for large parts of the world. Uh, even then, in the editorial, I was mentioning that our frontliners would be quite different. Unlike SARS, where the frontliners were just healthcare workers, for COVID-19, by February in Singapore, we were seeing the large number of cases were really in the retail and tourism industry. And these workers were infected because they were dealing with tourists from China. And some of these Chinese tourists were infected. They visited Singapore. And the first occupational groups that were impacted by COVID-19 in Singapore were largely the retail staff, people working in the tourism industry, the tour guides, and so on. 
Uh, from there, we realized that, yes, our frontliners could also include chefs, people in, working as uh, emergency responders, the police force, delivery riders, and so on. And as early as February, we found a big cluster from people coming to Singapore for an international conference. And one of the conference attendees was impacted by COVID-19. And this spread to the other conference attendees and they subsequently left for their home countries and they passed infections elsewhere. Well, one of the predictions I made in the editorial was that we probably wouldn't see a vaccination for the very near future and that we needed to depend more on uh, safe measures at the workplace. But I was wrong then because the vaccine appeared in record time in the history of mankind. And now a vaccination is a mainstay of our prevention efforts. Uh, we were also able to share our experiences from SARS to how this might impact our occupational health responses to COVID-19. And this was published also fairly early in the pandemic in May in the Journal of Occupational Health. And from there, even at that time, vaccines were something which uh, were not thought of to be in the horizon in the very near future. We were fo focusing on preventive measures such as using of PPE and safe measures at the workplace, testing, detection, isolation, and containment. Uh, by the May of 2020, a new occupational group emerged, which caused concern, and that was migrant workers. In Singapore, by May, early May of 2020, there were almost 20,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 among migrant workers living in dormitories. And they were fortunately young, healthy populations. Most of them had mild or, or asymptomatic cases of COVID-19. But uh, I wrote a piece in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine to highlight that this is one area of concern. We should focus on this. Dormitories, not only dormitories, but also prisons, army barracks, uh, nursing homes, and so on. And increasingly, since May, we are seeing such clusters, huge clusters in the different countries I work in. Uh, in Brunei, for example, in the last uh, half a year or so, we saw quite a few infections in migrant workers' housing. So this is one a huge uh, potential risk area for an underserved and often neglected uh, working population. Early on also, I think we had grappled with issues of case definitions of COVID. But looking back, giving a case definition of COVID is much easier than for giving a case definition for long COVID where it's still very, very unclear even now. Uh, the screen populations in the initial months of the outbreak were very limited in many countries. And this is because of the lack of laboratory facilities. Some countries use uh, just purely clinical grounds for diagnosis. Other countries with lab facilities use PCR. Subsequently, we have antigen rapid testing. And nowadays we have all kinds of other techniques. We can use the breath, we can use saliva to do tests to confirm diagnosis for COVID-19. But a lot of what we see, a lot of the figures of COVID-19 throughout the world depends on the testing capacity in the country, what are the indications for testing in the country, and what are the regimes used for the testing. So for example, uh, we shared some data in the ASEAN region. This was published uh, in 
2020 in the Western Pacific Surveillance and Response Journal of the WHO, we showed that in early March um, in ASEAN, Singapore had the highest number of cases, 117, with a population of 5.8 million. In contrast, the other ASEAN countries had very, very low numbers. Um, Vietnam 16, Philippines 3, Indonesia 2, Cambodia 1, Thailand only had 47 cases. By the end of April, the numbers increased. Singapore again had the most number of cases, 15,000, and that was because of extensive testing. Uh, the other ASEAN countries also had very, very low numbers then. And I think a lot of it was due to um, the availability of testing and testing facilities and testing regimes. If you fast forward to December 2021, this was data taken just a few days ago from the World Ometer Coronavirus uh, data. We find that the numbers are quite different now. And countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia have millions of cases. Singapore only had about 270,000 cases. And if you look at the infection rates per capita population, infection rates range from about 0.7% of the population with COVID-19 in Cambodia, which is probably an underestimate, to a high of about 8% in Malaysia. For the other ASEAN countries, it ranges from 0.7 to 8.3, probably in the region of about 3, 4, 5%. So as the picture unfolds, we will see uh, different numbers. But how many cases we have, as I mentioned earlier, depends on how many tests are done. So in July last year, President Trump then said that, oh, US would have half the number of cases if it didn't have the testing. So I don't think he was a great fan of testing and he asked for fewer COVID-19 tests, and subsequently the CDC recommended less testing. And with less testing, obviously you see a reduction of cases. But as the world progresses, I think in November 2021 in Sweden, Sweden says that you probably don't need to test even if you have symptoms of the disease. And this is part of a strategy of going forward to living with COVID-19 as something endemic. So we know that for influenza, we don't do routine testing and we're living with influenza as, as endemic. So this was the stance in uh, Sweden in November, 2021, but with the emergence of Omicron just a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure whether Sweden might change uh, this policy. So we'll wait and see. But eventually I feel that we probably might not have to do so much testing as we ease out of the pandemic. Lockdowns were a huge feature of uh, COVID-19. And we know that by April, 2020, over a third of the global population was under some form of movement restriction or COVID-19 lockdown. Even today, some countries have some kinds of lockdown uh, I hear that the Netherlands, they stopped the lockdown, but recently they imposed some sort of curfew. And right now in Brunei, where I'm working, we have a curfew from 10 p.m. at night to 4 a.m. in the morning to try to uh, restrict unnecessary movements of the population. And in many other countries of the world, there's some kind of movement restrictions still present. And all of these lockdowns, all of these uh, restrictions will have huge psychosocial impacts. And this has psychosocial impacts, not only on the general population, but also on healthcare workers. And uh, we've done some work, colleagues from Singapore, Brunei, myself, and colleagues in Vietnam to see what it's like in countries like Vietnam. We do know that we can minimize uh, the re requirement for large-scale lockdowns. And this can be done by using early, stringent social distancing measures. 
measures uh, in addition to social distancing, masking, hand washing, and so on. And we did review the evidence from countries worldwide, and we found that, yes, this is true. So if we can have successful social distancing measures, masking policies, and so on, there is perhaps less of a need for large-scale lockdowns. And this is something useful to know for the next pandemic. Treatment uh, was something very much on our minds, especially early on in the pandemic. And we were uh, fairly uh, quick to write a commentary in the journal Critical Care. Uh, this was published in March. And we said that based on our previous experience with treating uh, these newly emerging viruses, convalescent plus conval Convalescent plasma is one of the forgotten immunologically based strategies. And uh, this is something which is of great interest throughout the world. And subsequently, this was a proven method of treatment which was effective. In contrast, there were many, many other treatments uh, which were promoted by some scientists by some politicians, things like chloroquine, things like ivermectin, which have been shown not to be effective. And uh, these fake news doesn't really help the global community. So I find that it's really important that we keep up to date and not only keep up to date with scientific uh, advances, but we should also embrace change. And here, it's rather fortunate that in the field of occupational medicine over the last few years, there's been a lot of disruptive technology. Uh, there's automation and so on. We have to adapt to this disruptive technology and we have been embracing change throughout the years. Now, contact tracing is much, much more uh, easy compared to two decades ago. We have real-time updates, social media, is very useful as a tool, but there are also the downsides of social media, uh, such as the spread of an infodemic of false information. For scientific advances, mRNA vaccines, mRNA uh, medicines, something very new in the last few decades. I think about two years ago, I was fortunate to meet the CEO of, of uh, BioNTech. He's an academic, and he was using mRNA technology to develop cancer uh, targeted therapeutics. And it was something quite new to me then. And I had a chance to talk to him and listen to him about this technology. So it wasn't something completely novel to me when it appeared. For therapeutics, uh, different drugs, many, many new drugs. Uh, ECMO wasn't used very widely previously. Now it's used uh, quite commonly. Uh, point of care testing options, many, many new advances, which we have to find out how sensitive it is, how uh, specific it is, how reliable it is, and so on. And now we have to keep up to date with variants of concern and long COVID. So we should sit back, ask ourselves, are we up to date? Did we embrace any new changes in this pandemic? And if we have been doing so, and that's good because we have to do this on a lifelong basis. That's also very important to have international cooperation. In October this year, there was a special ministerial meeting in ASEAN. I was uh, fortunate to be the moderator for the session. How can the ASEAN region prepare for disease X? In other words, how do we prepare for the next pandemic? We have leading experts from throughout ASEAN. We had Dr. Anu Pong from Thailand on the panel. We had Datuk Nohayati from Malaysia. We had Professor Leo from uh, Singapore. And we had Dr. Gordon Galia from the WHO China office. So it was a very, very good discussion to see how as a region in ASEAN, we can help each other so that we respond better to the next pandemic. Mental health of frontliners, really, really important. 
especially since COVID has been going on for two years. PPE, safe management measures, we have to have a slew of safe management measures in the workplace, return to work issues. As people return to work from working from home, lots of measures have to be implemented. So again, we've done lots of international cooperation. We've done uh, work with Vietnam, Singapore, Brunei to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the life of work, life and work of uh, healthcare workers. Um, and at a personal level, what do we do to promote our mental health? There were times when we had to work from home. We weren't allowed to exercise. We weren't allowed to travel for the last two years. So it's good to develop had hobbies. So I took up Tai Chi. So Tai Chi is something you can do at home safely. I took up my ukulele again. It's really good for mental health. We didn't have dinners anymore. So we had Zoom dinners. We had mukbangs where we shared uh, silly videos of self-eating with family members, with friends. Instead of hikes and runs in groups, we had virtual hikes, virtual runs. And if I had to go on hikes, I went on hikes solo or just with another uh, close family member. So we had to adapt ourselves, but I think it's really important that we keep our social life uh, vibrant and active so that we are mentally resilient. Otherwise, it's all too easy to burn out. Uh, we've also did some studies on healthcare workers' preparedness and response to COVID-19 in Brunei. And here you see a picture of myself and the third one from the left. And this is uh, my colleagues from the Institute of Health Sciences in University of Brunei, Darussalam, in our vaccination center. So as part of the national response to COVID-19, we set up a vaccination center to vaccinate the general population, including the elderly and the children. And this has been running for the last few months and it is really full-time work. So when I tell people that, uh, yes, you know, I'm running a vaccination center, people usually ask me, so, you know, what do you do there? Do you give injection? And the answer is no, I don't give injection because I got many trained colleagues who can give injections. So as a doctor, I think um, my colleagues who are doctors and myself, our main role is to do medical assessments. We do reviews of people with medical concerns to see whether they can get the vaccine or not, um, whether they should defer and so on. We also um, look at the people post-vaccination to see whether they have adverse reactions. And there were a few instances where we had to do uh, acute immediate care. The most unpleasant thing about the vaccination center duty was the regular PCR test. We had to do PCR tests every week to make sure that we are fit. And it's rather unpleasant, unpleasant something I still haven't got used to. So as of two days ago, in Brunei, about 83% of the residents have got at least two doses of the vaccine and over 94% have received at least one dose. So it has been a very successful response in Brunei. And as a result, by the end of December, we will close down our vaccination center and go back to meeting our students who will be returning to campus from January next year. In the region, we see that the vaccination rates are rather variable um, and the percentages uh, percentages of those people in the various countries that have received at least two doses of the vaccine. People considered to be fully vaccinated. So Brunei, Cambodia, uh, Singapore, 80% and above, Malaysia, almost 80%, um, Thailand, about 60%, and so on. The lowest is Myanmar, about 21%. So as a region, it's still variable, and this will have implications when we open up the region for intra-ASEAN travel. So I think we are getting there, and hopefully uh, all the countries in ASEAN will have very high vaccination rates in the coming months. Uh, while working in the vaccination center, we also uh, had a chance to do some research and do some academic writing. 
So one of the uh, issues faced by people giving vaccines was vaccine contamination. So we were very particular about this. Yeah, you can see two syringes uh, where the red arrows show some contaminants in the vaccine. So we wrote up a piece on vaccine contamination, causes, consequences, and control. This has been submitted to vaccine. It is currently being reviewed. Uh, we've submitted a revised version. Hopefully, we should get some good news about this publication in the next couple of days or weeks. Uh, preventing infection in the workplaces, in our workplaces, is also very important. I'm also a visiting consultant to the Singapore General Hospital in Singapore. And we find that intra-hospital infection uh, is something we really worry about. And for many hospitals, healthcare workers are very, very good when we deal with patients because we know that the patients have got infection. Yeah, so we cover ourselves properly, we use PPE. Uh, we also make sure that we are tested, that we are clear, but sometimes some people might slip through the cracks. And there was a recent publication in Occupational Medicine to show that the greatest number of infections in healthcare workers in hospitals occur when the healthcare workers meet together, when they relax in the rest areas, in the changing rooms, and so on. So this is a high risk area when they remove the PPE, interact with colleagues who may be infected. And in that report in occupational medicine, the numbers in fact infected from uh, the hospital was more from interacting with colleagues than from interacting with patients. So this is something to just bear in mind. Uh, knowledge and self-protective practices vary throughout the region, and we also have some data from uh, Vietnam. What about our patients who work in the different industries? We know that uh, a lot of construction workers are returning to work. This is one industry that has to continue. So we also had um, some lessons learned from Singapore where we wrote up and we want to share with the ASEAN community. This is published in the Journal Safety and Health at Work uh, in this year. So for what's coming, I think we have to adapt to the new normal. Lots of us are working from home now. And from working from home, it is just one short step to working from anywhere. So I need not work from home in my home country. I can work from another country. So this will give us lots of freedom to work. But with freedom also comes competition. Employers can employ people from anywhere in the world. So we have to be really uh, relevant. We really have to add value to our employers because of this ability to work from anywhere. PPE, safe management measures, Many new ones are in place now. Biosecurity is an important, important issue. Lockdowns, quarantines, vaccinations, boosters, differentiated measures. Travel is not easy now because we have to incorporate health checks as well as security checks. So the new normal, uh, Dr. Yabra mentioned quite a lot of this in post-pandemic practice. We have to prepare for that and adapt. So in countries like Singapore, from January 1st, only vaccinated workers can return to work. Unvaccinated workers cannot return to work unless they are tested frequently and they have to pay for the test. In New Zealand, they're moving towards a two-tier society, but globally already the unvaccinated are an underclass. Organizing face-to-face -face meetings, something we haven't done very much in the last two years, will be much, much more stringent. We have to organize meetings only which are necessary. We use meeting rooms at half the capacity, try to keep it as short as possible. And there's a whole list of measures which we can do when we organize face-to-face -face meetings when we return to work. So these are some of the safe management measures that we have to adapt to 
in the future. And as teachers, how do we teach our students? So with COVID-19, we have to adapt our teaching style. We do a lot of remote teaching, um, but also our curriculum. In the last few decades, I think there's been a lot of focus on the non-communicable diseases and the communicable diseases uh, probably given less attention. So when we look at our medical curriculum, we have to review this and see whether certain parts of the curriculum, such as um, communicable diseases, emerging infections, global health, have to be increased in the amount of time we spend on these topics. Then as part of teaching, uh, I was also quite fortunate to work by, with my medical students to tell them that, yes, why don't you use your medical knowledge and write a piece for a business and economics journal? And I managed to publish with my two medical students, Sheena and Ching En, in this uh, peer-reviewed and indexed journal. So I use the pandemic also as a learning tool with my medical students. So COVID is not over yet. Next pandemic, we don't know. It could be worse, it could be better. But the question is, are we prepared? And I think when we say, are we prepared? We should not say, are we prepared as individuals? Are we prepared as organizations? Are we prepared as countries? And are we prepared as a region, as ASEAN? So these are some things we should meet and discuss all the time. So in terms of my uh, reflections, I think the first and most important thing that I think I want to know about myself is that did I help? Did I add value? And this is something we should all ask ourselves. Did we help? Did we, did we add value? How prepared were we to face the pandemic? What new changes did we embrace? And what will be the new normal post-pandemic? Because we know for sure something will be coming and we have to be prepared. So with that, I'd like to end uh, just with a little advertisement. This is the textbook of occupational medicine practice. Uh, this is the fifth edition. A new edition will be coming out in early next year by February. And Dr. Adon has a chapter in this book on the cultural aspects of occupational medicine practice. And if you want to um, order this textbook, uh, here is a promo code. If you order it in, in advance, you can get a 30% discount. And that's the web link and so on. So this is just for your information. And um, with that, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. I'm open to questions now. Thank you, David Ko, for sharing us the interesting experiences. All right, before we have a lunch break, does anyone have any question? Uh, it looks like we have a few questions. Thank you for your active participation by Dr. Sutisa. He, uh, he asked that how can employer enforce their employees who work from home or overseas to comply with employer's health safety regulation like ones who work on site? Uh... I think that's an important question. Um, I think employers, depending on the capability of the employers, I think now with uh, tele applications, a lot of employers can do remote monitoring. I know that many healthcare, uh, many ministries of health can do remote monitoring of people on stay home notices by 
doing random tele or video conferencing calls, asking people to show a video around the site they are, uh, checking for test results, real time with a timestamp and so on. So these are some of the measures which are available, but uh, whether the employer chooses to do it or not really depends on um, the employer. Okay, thank you so much for the interesting question. So, sorry for some difficult situation. Uh, I, I, I have some uh, thing to share with uh, Professor David Go. I think uh, Professor David Go can manage his mental health. Good. See from the slide, he do the Tai Chi. He go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> but in Thailand, he dare not go outside. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I think uh, there. Uh, it is a uh, uh, great uh, pandemic, but uh, those who pass through this uh, is uh, there is a great opportunity. Yes, to see this pandemic and see what we manage it, and those who practice will have a good chance to practice during pandemic and see how it goes. Yes, it is a uh, very precious experience yeah uh, for for uh, this covid 19 i think uh, it's a very disruptive you see the vaccine came out in only uh, i think it is not uh, a year i think it's about eight months the vaccine coming out is against the 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 thing that we used to do yes uh and, and also, uh, you talk about the work from home. So now the, uh, the definition of the workplace is changing. Yes, because it's work from home, we can do anything. Uh, Dr. Chachai, Dr. Chachai uh, do some research and found that the, uh, those workers who work from home have a more weight gain. Yes, <laughs> and, and you see, uh, there are some health problems will increase for the worker who work from home, that uh, the health promotion is uh, will be more important in the future. I think, yeah. Uh, sure. For uh, the vaccine uh, and the long COVID, I think there will be uh, something that will happen in the future. So, so we must prepare for our workers also. Those who have vaccine. I don't know if there will be a long-term complication of the vaccine. Yes, and and for the long COVID also, it's, it's still vague. Uh, what symptom? What cause it? Uh, we we still don't know. Is there a subgroup of workers, a subgroup of people who have long COVID, subgroup who does, doesn't have long COVID? I think we, it it must be a study uh, in the future, and we can uh, separate those who at least from those who stay from the vaccine and the long COVID. Uh, and then that, that uh, I think in the future, uh, I don't know in Singapore is uh, or in Dubai, is there a law or a mandate to protect the healthcare worker? Just like in the OSHA, there is emergency uh, protection of uh, healthcare worker. I think in action, uh, we can uh, do as a network to protect uh, our healthcare worker. There will be the uh, the criteria or the rule or the regulation come out to protect our healthcare workers. Uh, because uh, I have some, uh, I have a research about post-COVID. And I interviewed the director of uh, 30 hospitals. Uh, before this, uh, the healthcare worker is uh, only uh, uh, little meaning for them. 
But now you can work uh, they they give them the important view for them. They have to keep the uh, human resource uh, just like healthcare care workers because in COVID they have to uh, isolation, quarantine for those who contact the patient. Yes. So so now they give important to the healthcare care workers. Yes, I think uh, in the next uh, post pandemic, the healthcare care worker will be more important and will be. Uh, we have something to protect them. Yes. Okay, that is my view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Milawan, do you have something uh, about this topic? I also like Tai Chi that you mentioned. <laughs> And also for me, since I also learned something about the traditional medicine. So during the last two years, I learned a lot about using the herbal medicine to uh, treat passion, but should be uh, taken as early as possible within the 20 hours that they can detect the positive uh, shaking or any uh, sign and symptom that uh, can can be diagnosed as um, influenza or COVID. Yeah, and, and we found that it also another alternative way for us also. So now we also start to learn some more start the research, the, the department of uh, high traditional medicine and alternative medicine, start to do some more research about this uh, about half years ago. So I think uh, within the short period, maybe they can come out some more uh, alternative way to take care about this COVID-19. But I think uh, maybe the Omicron, we already know about Micron. Now Omicron come. <laughs> so maybe it's also the mm, interesting topic that we, we should uh, um, enjoy to live with it. And we, uh, we hope that just like uh, all of you that talk about this, that we should live with not just not just try to get rid it, and since we live with it until it just like uh, any cold or influenza, we can develop uh, our immunity. We don't. We do hope that. But uh, thank you so much. That I really learned a lot from you, also, Professor Go. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah.